All right, greetings and welcome. We've spent a lot of lessons talking about artificial intelligence and how to use them in games and how to train one using training and evaluation data. And today we're going to take a step back and talk about artificial intelligence in a broader context in terms of its limitations and the ethical implications involved as AI starts to become more intertwined within our lives. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about the limitations of artificial intelligence machine learning systems. We're going to go over ethical implications involving using AI, especially in high risk or life threatening situations. We're going to talk about the concept of explainable AI, and then we're going to talk about different ethical priorities, uh, both from an academic perspective and industry perspective and the Department of Defense. So to get things started, let's talk about the potential benefits of AI. We've alluded to this a lot in the previous lessons, but let's actually list out why we're going through the trouble to build AI in the first place. So one of the main benefits of AI is that it has the potential to outperform human experts in a wide range of tasks. From chess to, you know, driving a car, AI, if trained properly, can not only demonstrate the same level of accuracy and performance as human beings at the task, but in many cases could even surpass it. So we have the potential to build better systems and do a large amount of things better than a human being can through the use of technology. AIs also help us reduce human risk. So there are a lot of situations where it's dangerous to have a human being involved. So for example, if I have the choice with having this guy with a flak vest or this robot investigate a package, it's probably better to try to get an AI to go investigate a suspicious package than have a human being in, the, in harm's way. Using AI can increase the range of problems we can solve, so maybe I don't want to send human beings out into sp deep space to investigate something if I can send an AI that can do the, the same task with the same level of performance. AIs also benefit from consistent performance. So human beings are good at tasks, but they make little mistakes from time to time. An AI that is running for one minute will be just as good as when it's running for one day, or one year, or a hundred years, right? It, computers are notoriously good at doing the same thing over and over, and AI is no exception. AIs also help us reduce the need for humans uh, to perform trivial tasks. So for example, there's a lot of jobs in the world right now that human beings do because there's no alternative. So for example, uh, sorting packages or navigating from one place to another, right? If an AI could do those things for us, we can have human beings focus on more important tasks in their lives. They can be more creative, they can solve bigger problems, and we can leave the smaller problems for the computers to do on our behalf. AIs are also notoriously fast, so a human being makes decisions in the order of you know, seconds, whereas for a computer, that's just an infinite amount of time. In the cyber community, we like to talk about uh, warfare at the speed of light. And with AI, you know, we are getting to the point where, um, especially on the network, attacks are happening at the nanosecond level. And we need something that can make decisions faster than a human being can even recognize that there's a problem. And AI provides a potential solution to that. And what's cool about AI from a research perspective is that it can help us discover uh, hidden insights. So here are a couple of mammogram photographs where they are looking for suspicious um, lumps that could be tumors. So here is an example of an AI that was trained to detect these tumors by human experts. And over time, the AI got just as good at detecting the tumors. And in fact, at some point, it even got better at detecting things the, the experts couldn't find. And by going back and looking at the models, the experts were able to learn what it is the AI was discovering, and that helped them be better at their own job. So here, it's like when I teach you guys, I teach you how to program, but the more questions you ask me, the more you force me to reflect on how I do things, and that helps me learn even more. It's the same thing with AI. So while there's lots of benefits to AI, there's also some limitations with AI systems as they are currently built. And here we're going to talk about five of them. So the first one is narrow focus. So if I was to review real quick this idea of weak versus strong AI, a weak AI is basically an AI that is good at performing a task or a subset of tasks. A strong AI is a general problem solver, right? It can solve complicated tasks. It can take its knowledge from one domain and transfer it to another. Right now, we're really good at building weak AI. We can build systems with a specific task in mind, so driving a car or diagnosing an illness, but we can't build systems right now that are really general problem solvers. So Deep Blue could beat Gary Kasparov at chess, but he can't play checkers. And when we made a Spy Hunter AI, it was really good at playing Spy Hunter, but it couldn't play Pong, even though Pong is technically a simpler game. The next issue with AI is that 
there's a really high cost to create them. So if I want to make a rule-based AI to perform a complicated task like driving, that's going to be really challenging. I have to painstakingly tell the AI what to do in every possible situation. All of you are experts in driving, but if I told you to write down all the rules, it'd be very challenging for you to do so. They also assume that human beings' expertise is comprehensive. Oftentimes, we rely on our ability to um, innovate and uh, make things up on the fly that get us through a lot of life's problems. But an AI doesn't have that same luxury. So it's really hard for us to code a computer to innovate or to you know just think outside the box. Machine learning algorithms kind of solve this problem by giving the computers the ability to derive rules and models on their own, but they have their own problem. They're really dependent on data. So when we were doing the Air Force fitness test example, I showed you how it can take hundreds or even thousands of training instances to teach an AI how to recognize something as simple as whether or not you get an excellent or a satisfactory on the fitness test. Uh, getting and labeling that data took a lot of work. I had to have all of you do it. And sometimes you don't have perfect data. So if I'm doing a Tesla and I'm doing self-driving cars, you know, if I only have uh, driving data for cars in America, that system won't work very well when I move over to England where they drive on the opposite side of the road. So there's if I have omissions or gaps in my data, that can affect the type of AI that I can produce. The third issue is the idea of hidden bias. So it's easy to think of computers as being cold and unbiased, but the reality is that all AI systems have some form of bias. So for example, when we made the Spy Hunter AI, we created an AI that for some reason always drove to the left side of the screen. I didn't plan on it to do that, but when we were developing the algorithm, we said, pick the first path that gets us all the way to the end of the road without hitting another car. And it just so happened that path was always towards the left, right? It always looked at the left path first. So a model may end up learning unintentional patterns or correlations if we're not careful. It's only as good as the training. So here, for example, is a data set that was produced where they tried to teach an AI how to uh, predict between a wolf and a husky because they look similar. So here, for example, you see the, the AI was pretty good. It predicted wolf, and it was really a wolf, predicted husky, and it was really a husky. But when they went and actually looked at the model behind the scenes, and they said, what was it actually learning? What they discovered what, was that the AI wasn't looking at the picture. It was looking at the background. So if there was snow, it just happened to be a, a, a wolf. And when there wasn't snow, it was a husky. So they built a really elaborate weather detector. Microsoft had another issue with their uh, data set. So here they were trying to detect gender based off a of photograph and their data set had largely light skinned people uh, and lar predominantly males. So the system was really good at uh, detecting this group. But here when the, the skin was darker and it was females, it had a harder time detecting that gender. There's also the issue of responsibility. Right now it's pretty clear when a software developer develops code and it breaks, it's the developer's fault, or at the very least, it's the company's fault. Uh, with an AI system, we don't have that same precedent in mind. Uh, when I de develop a self-driving car, for example, I can train it against all the situations I think it will encounter, but obviously the AI is going to encounter things that I didn't plan for, so it's hard to say who's at fault. Is it the programmer's fault for creating a system that you know ended up killing somebody? Is it the trainer's fault for giving it the wrong data? Can we just blame the AI? These are areas that for all intents and purposes, they're still gray in our society. We, we really haven't tackled it yet. The fifth and last problem is lack of interpretability. And by interpretability, I mean our ability to understand what an AI is actually learning. Um, so why do we care? If we have a self-driving car and it drives off the road, we want to make sure it's for the right reasons. You know, Understanding what the AI is thinking uh, helps us build trust in that system. You know, and that's going to become more important as the system start making decisions that can affect our lives. The problem is that some AIs are more intelligible than others. So for example, it's easy to look at a decision tree, uh, like we did in the previous lesson, and see what the AI learned, right? We can see what decisions it's making. But there are some algorithms that are basically black boxes. So here, for example, is what we call a neural network. So a neural network has these input nodes, and we give it some data. It has some hidden math where it's doing some stuff, and then it produces an output. So here the task is, given these dots, can the, the neural network detect a blue dot versus an orange dot? And what I'm just going to do is I'm going to push this button and we train it. And as it's training, you can actually see the result, right? It, it actually successfully learned the difference between an orange dot 
and a blue dot and it can classify it. And here's the error. So it's very accurate. Um, the trick is when I look at it, I can't really see what it learned, right? I sit there and go, oh, it has a weight of 0.5 here, a weight of 0.73. I don't know what any of these actually mean, right? I don't know if it's learning the right thing. And because of that, I kind of have to treat it like a black box. So it's really cool that it learned something, but I don't know what's happening behind the scenes. And that could potentially be an issue. So why does it matter? Um, it matters because AI is starting to be used in systems that have a measurable impact on our lives. So what I want to show you here is a um, academic problem that we refer to as the trolley problem. So in the trolley problem, we have an AI that controls a trolley, and the trolley is going down, and there's an intersection. And the intersection, there are people on the train tracks. So there's five people on one train track, and there's one person on the other train track. And the AI has to make a decision that's going to end up killing one of one or the other right it's going to kill the five people or one or the other um, and it's an interesting question at that point of how is the ai going to make that decision and how you know what rationale is it going to use it gets more complicated for example if we if those five people end up being five doctors and the one person ends up being an elderly person is it okay to kill an elderly person to save five doctors or is it not even when i give this question to a human being you, there's no real good answer for that. People have to justify, and you can always argue that if you choose path A or path B, no matter what, you're gonna make someone mad, right? Are you comfortable with an AI making this decision? You know, you don't know how it was trained, you don't know who trained it, uh, maybe that person, maybe the trainer was a doctor, just really likes doctors, right? Uh, how would you feel if you were the elderly person and a computer made the decision that your life was expendable? How would you feel if you were the doctors and they decided that the elderly person was more valuable because they had contributed more to society? There's a lot of interesting questions about how the AI makes its decision. And I think it's important for us to remember that there's no right answer to it, but are we comfortable with a computer making that decision? So issues like the, the trolley problem illustrate the need for ethical AI. Um, as they become more entwined in our lives, we're gonna to have to think about why it is, you know, what level of decisions we're comfortable with an AI making. Um, and we probably don't wanna treat them like a black box, right? We don't wanna say, oh, you know, I put it in the algorithm and it said I had to die. I guess I'm cool with that, right? The idea of not just making sure that AIs do the right thing, but making sure that the process of creating the AI follows some form of ethical framework is gonna become more important as we start building them. So we need to think about not only how are we, you know, what decisions it makes, but how are we developing and training them and how are we validating that the AIs are actually going to do the right thing. And this is gonna be hard because we don't know all the situations an AI will encounter during its lifetime, if we even wanna call it a lifetime, right? Um, and as a society, I think it's going to become even more important for us to understand when using AI is appropriate AI to have. So there's a couple ways that we're tackling this problem. So one way is through what we call explainable AI. The idea of explainable AI is AI, cr producing AI models that can explain why they're arriving at their decisions. And the goal is to help human beings understand and trust the AI because we, we know what decisions they're making. So for example, here, right now in our current state, we give the AI training data, it makes a, a model or a function, and then the human being, as it's going through this process, the human being has no say. What we really want to get to is a human being being able to say, I know why the AI made that decision. Uh, so here, for example, this is one from academia where uh, they had a fish classifier where th they asked the computer to uh, say like, oh, look, it predicts that this is a fish. And then the uh, user is able to query the computer and say, hey, look, why are you saying this? And then the AI actually has to explain. It says, well, well, here I see red and there's green and I see more green than red. Therefore, I think it's a fish. And then the human being can interrogate it, right? It can say, oh, it looks like you're just recognizing the anemone and not the fish. Um, you know, what are you you know, how are you making that decision? And then the AI has to respond. So there's a lot of interrogation that goes on. So here, for example, um, the human is suspicious that there is, uh, that it's recognizing the anemone, so it gets rid of it. And then it says, oh, I still see more green, therefore it's a fish. And now we are pretty confident that it knows what a fish is. Now we're gonna talk about ethical frameworks. And this is the part where I feel a little uncomfortable because you know, as a computer scientist, there's lots of ways that we can talk about things, but ethics is a, a tricky subject in and of its own right. Um, there is no ethical theory that everybody universally agrees upon, um, and there's lots of philosophies, like utilitarianism says, you know, do what causes the least pain. Right? And then ego, 
egoistic uh, talks about your self-interest and then there's some philosophies that talk about just the common good do what's in the common good if these all sound nebulous it's because they are nebulous uh, as a computer scientist, I like thinking in concrete terms, something I can code, and algorithms depend on us being very precise. Uh, with ethics, it's very hard for us to uh, codify ethics in a way that we can write in an algorithm. So there's really no agreed upon ethical framework for artificial intelligence. So what we're seeing are organizations coming up with their own ethical frameworks to meet what their needs are. So we're going to look at three different perspectives of AI ethics. Um, the first is going to be an academic perspective. So this one, uh, this paper, which you, I'm going to post on Canvas if you want to look over it, is talking about the criteria that needs to be satisfied for AI to be used in society. So they talk about this idea of transparent to inspection, that I should be able to, as a developer, explain how the AI was created. Uh, predictability. I should be able to explain uh, how the AI operates. Right? Users should be able to explain what the AI is doing. Robust against manipulation is we should be able to guarantee that the AI can't be easily tricked or duped into doing the wrong thing. And responsibility. AI developers need to understand that they could potentially be the ones who are held liable if something goes wrong. So now let's take a look at the same idea from an industry perspective. So here I happen to have the AI ethical criteria from Google, uh, but it turns out that a lot of other companies have developed their own ethical criteria. And for the lab, you're going to have to actually go and research one of those and study it in a little bit of detail. But the Google one is interesting because they are specifically interested in not only how they develop their technology, but where and how they're going to apply it. So here are the tenets for how Google wants to uh, develop their technology. So they are talking about things like making sure their technology uh, has some sort of social benefit to it, making sure that it's tested for safety, uh, eliminating that unfair bias. Uh, they talk about this idea of upholding high standards of scientific excellence, which is essentially their way of saying that making sure that they publish and make sure that there's a rigorous fashion to how they develop the AI so that they aren't introducing any un un unintentional behavior. And they're also talking about making sure that they want to limit how their AI technologies are used for harmful or abusive applications. So here, they specifically list applications where they don't want to use their technology. So technologies that cause harm or gather info, which is kind of ironic for Google, but uh, technologies that violate human rights. So in the DOD side, there was, uh, for Project Maven, Google used to contribute some technologies that supported that, and as they developed their ethical criteria, they made the decision that they didn't want their technologies to be used for that. So they actually pulled out, uh, and there's a lot of news articles that, that talk about that. I'll try to include one in Canvas so you can read up on it. There's also um, the ethical principles from the DOD perspective. So the Defense Innovation Board is a, you can think of them as like a think tank that uh, helps the DOD uh, codify its philosophies and here they talked about what AI is and how they want to develop and utilize it as a war fighting capacity. So the other two, academia is talking about how it's going to be used in society, uh, same thing with Google to some extent, the DOD is talking about how we're going to use it as a tool to help us accomplish our mission. So they have, uh, their tenants are responsibility, making sure that we are developing that AI in a responsible way. Uh, equitable, making sure that we are avoiding unintended bias in our uh, systems, traceable, making sure that we can explain how the system works and how it functions, reliable, making sure that the system functions as, as intended during its uh, lifetime, and then governable, which is an interesting one. So uh, this one is talking about the idea of being able to turn AI off if, ne if necessary. So maybe someone watched a little bit too much Terminator, but this idea of turning it off is something that is unique to the DOD and is kind of an interesting perspective on how they view AI could potentially be uh, used or abused or turned against us. So here, when we put them side to side, they may call them different things, but you can see that a lot of the ideas flow across the different domains. So the idea of transparency goes, you know, has a, a an analog in the industry and on the DOD side. And you can see the same thing for responsibility. You know, making sure you're accountable. Making the DOD also calls it responsibility. Um, you can see in black where the they differ. So Google has. Uh, like I said, they are focused more on how that AI technology is going to be used in society for good. And then the DoD is talking more about being able to control AI and being able to use it to help us accomplish our mission. I think it's important to stress that everything we've talked about so far sounds 
you know, nebulous and up in the sky, but it's important because this isn't science fiction. AI is already being incorporated in our lives. We're already seeing examples where AI are intention unintentionally making decisions that are having an adverse effect. So here we're seeing, uh, here's an article about um, uh, black people who were uh, given different medical treatment because the AI uh, the data set consisted primarily of white people, so it treated black people differently. Uh, here, the same thing for um, AI hiring tools. The, the data set consisted too much of men, and so it tended to give preferential treatment to hiring men. Even though that wasn't the intended effect of the AI, it's just what happened as a result unintentionally through the training process. And here we're going to show uh, an example of where an AI actually killed someone. So this is uh, an Uber crash that happened a while back where the Uber car accidentally hit a person in the night. So here's the video. Now to a new video showing what happened just moments before that deadly Uber crash involving a self-driving car. ABC's Diane Macedo has the story. This dash cam video shows the horrifying seconds before a self-driving Uber hit and killed a pedestrian in Arizona. Tempe police released two videos Wednesday. One filming outside the car shows 49-year-old Elaine Herzberg crossing the road with her bicycle. It pauses just before the moment of impact. Another camera filming inside the car shows a human safety driver seated in the front. So clearly in this situation, the human driver, you know, who was supposed to be the safeguard, uh, didn't do his job. Uh, but there's still a question of what are we going to do when these types of situations happen in our lives? When a person hits a person or when a person causes a car accident, we've at least seen that before in society. and We have laws and rules on what to do in those situations. But with AI, it's all untreaded territory, right? We, we have no idea. Uh, are we going to blame the car? Are we going to blame the manufacturer? Is the, the guy, the safety driver, responsible? In all of these situations, you know, it's important to realize that none of this has been explored before. So as we are developing AI technologies, we need to think about how it's going to impact our lives. And that always has to be at the forefront so that when we develop the technologies that make those decisions, we're not in unintentionally causing more harm than good. So we finished our lesson. Uh, you now have a better sense of the idea of the benefits and limitations of AI systems. Uh, we can talk about ethical implications, uh, especially when AI is used in life-threatening situations, high-risk situations. Uh, we've talked about the need for explainable AI, being able to understand why AI is making the decisions that it's making, and how that's going to become even more important when it starts to make decisions like, hey, who are we accepting to college? Who are you going to let join the military? What targets are acceptable? Right? We need to make sure we can under. Uh, we can trust AI in those in those areas. And finally, we looked at different types of ethical priorities, right, from academia to industry to the Department of Defense. And we've seen that there's a common thread amongst all of them, but also noticeable differences. And more importantly, we've seen how they are all basically being written on the fly. Like we are developing these as the situation evolves. So it's going to become even more important in the future for you, especially as you become Air Force officers, to think about how AI should be used in the Department of Defense because eventually you're going to be the ones writing that policy and you're going to be the ones who are deciding what's acceptable and not acceptable. So we have finished our AI block. I hope you found it to be fun and informative or at, le at the very least interesting. Uh, take care if you have any questions and make sure you uh, work on the labs, make sure you do your final project, do your homework, and uh, make sure that you reach out to us if you have any questions. So take care.